Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's where we'll be this morning. I know that you are one of two people, right? There are two, two kinds of people in this world that exist. One person looks at something like a loaf of bread and says, that expiration date on there is past, so I'm going to throw it in the trash. And then the other type of person looks at the loaf of bread and says, I'm going to go hunting for mold to see if this thing's still good enough to eat. So you're either somebody who looks at that expiration date as a suggestion or as a trash buy date. I don't know which one of the two you are, and some of you may say, well, it just depends on what it is. And we'll smell it and see. Otherwise, I'm going to trash it and wait until we go to the grocery. Right? There's the two categories. Well, I say this because food scientists found some type of pasta in an Egyptian pyramid. I don't know if you heard about it, but they boiled it and ate it. And they said it was still fresh. That's because pasta... Uh, supposedly will virtually last forever and not go bad. Another version of this is the Twinkie. Supposedly uh, a Twinkie will last past a nuclear <coughs> fallout. One teacher, that, that's because one teacher put a Twinkie on their chalkboard for like 30 years and then ate it. So here's the thing. Our shelf life as individuals, for us individually, right? The day that we are, this body goes completely bad and we can't function anymore and we expire. Our expiration date is not like Egyptian pasta and it's not like a Twinkie. What our expiration date that we all have it's like a salad mix in the bottom of the fridge. Samantha and I like healthy eating and taking care of the environment. So uh, we buy salad mixes. And I told her the other day, I said, it's time that we buy another salad mix. This one's ready for the trash. So uh, I assume that we'll go and go to Walmart and get another salad mix to put and rot in the bottom of our fridge. Because it's good for the landfill to, put, to get all that bacteria started before they put it away. So we care about our environment and we try to eat healthy. So you're welcome, right? I'm leaving this world for our children, better off because of the salad mixes that we put into the landfill on a regular basis. That's the thing. Our expiration date's not like the Twinkie, it's like the salad mix. And we, need the verses before us today, 1 Corinthians 15, because of that short expiration date. We are blind to our future and shortly to expire, so we want to know, as Christians, what's certain to come <coughs> in the future for us in a bodily resurrection. So that's why we look at these verses today. To see what the resurrection, life after death, will be like. If you wouldn't mind standing in the honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. That's where it will be today. But someone <coughs> will ask, beginning of verse 35... How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. 
For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. <coughs> so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus, as it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Let us pray. Father, we ask that as we look at your word today, that you would conform us more into the man of heaven and his image. That's what we ask that you would do for us. Please help us to glorify you alone and to stand under the authority of your word. and Let your thoughts be conveyed to your people by the preaching of your word. It's what we ask that you would so graciously give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all can be seated. So because of our expiration date, Paul answers the question, what will the resurrection of the dead be like? He summarizes it, saying that just as we bore the image of Adam and we look like him and participate in his reality, so shall we share in the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the reason for this whole 15th chapter, as we now cross into 35 verses of it, is because though there are those at the church of Corinth who were doubting the resurrection. So Paul addresses them. They, did, they believed in life after death, but they thought that the bodies would not play a role in it. But what we know as Christians is that the Spirit goes to God who gave it. The bodies go in the ground, as we've seen before in our, in our study. And that one day there will be a bodily resurrection. Which was contrary to the thought of the day, and contrary to thoughts of our day. So, Paul is addressing these people, knowing that they aren't good-hearted. So they're not seeking wisdom, but announcing their folly. And how do we know that Paul is addressing people who are cynical? Because they doubt that God could take a rotten body eaten by worms and bring it back to some type of gory Walking Dead episode for all of us in the near future. Paul says it's nothing like that, but it's more like God gardening. Here's what he says that our resurrection will entail. In Christ, we will be raised, number one, like plants from the ground. Like plants from the ground. That's the description we see in verse 36. Beginning of verse 36, we know that these are cynics who are not seeking wisdom, but announcing folly, because here's how Paul responds to them. You fools. He says, you foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be but a bare kernel, perhaps, of wheat or some other grain. So how is God able to raise the dead? The same way that he raises his plants. Plants come to life, but first they go into the ground and they appear to be dead. Verse 37, he clarifies it. You don't put a flower under the dirt. I'm not, I'm not that the smartest 
uh, sharpest tool in the shed. But I, I, I think that you plant seeds to grow flowers. You don't bury, in most times, the entire thing, right? It's uh, gardening 101 for us today, right? Don't put the whole thing under the ground. It's good. But the point he's making here is that you put a seed, like we put these bodies, in the ground. And what God does with plants, he does with people. Now, this is important for us because we have a lot of family, if you're like me, and a lot of friends that we have planted. <clears throat> And I, and I say that based on the authority of these <clears throat> verses, that in Christ, these people are planted. If they're Christians, we don't lose them. We plant them. And they return like flowers in the spring. So, this means that death doesn't have the last word on any of our loved ones. That's significant for us. So now, with people who have gone on before, we may be looking down at covered over dirt. But staring at the soil only is going to last for a while. Because one day, God will raise their body. And they'll come up just like a flower. So God is going to cause something to come out of the ground. But the difficulty for us is waiting. That's what that's what that's what hurts, doesn't it? Like we're comforted when we lose Christians, but yet there's pain because we have to wait. The same way that you plant something and you don't go back five seconds later and dig it back up. But there's patience involved in this process. Many of us have planted a lot. Many of us are waiting on a lot. So, we look at the verse. He says that God is the one who's going to do this. So how is this going to work? They go in the ground like a plant. They're going to come up. Verse 38, God is the one that raises them. Verse 39, he clothes animals, plants, planets, stars, and bodies. We'll do the same for those who die before Christ's return. So the question then becomes, if that's how it's going to happen, then what's going to be the difference between our body now, the body when we die, the body when we're raised? I'm glad you all asked, because that's what he answers. Our resurrection will be a immortal. Notice the second half of verse 42. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. Our bodies go into the ground, corrupted, broken, maybe ravaged by cancer or Alzheimer's or other various diseases with a bunch of parts that don't work. The whole thing's shot. That's how we got there, right? I don't know about you, but I'm going to be 35 in about a week or two. I don't know what today is. I'll be 35 this month. And I feel the perishability of the body right now. You know what gets me real sore? Sleeping. You know? <laughs> Katie, don't ever get old. <laughs> <coughs> you know what hurts? Sleeping. <coughs> Sleeping hurts. So many of us have to take medicine to control our pain and or to go to the chiropractor or the heart doctor <coughs> to function because our bodies are perishing. That's a little bit of death in my bones that I'm feeling right now in my back. That's what that is. The point he makes here is that our resurrection will be immortal, imperishable. So that pain in my 
lower back that I'm currently feeling is only temporary. It only, it's only temporary. It hurts right now. And every day, all day. But it won't. Because this body is going to get turned in. And I'm going to get a different working model. Hope he's better looking. Okay. Now, thank you for the no amen on that part. We will go into the ground. Y'all are so sweet. Uh, broken. As these bodies continue to decay. But we raised by Christ imperishable, incorruptible, and immortal. So this is the first, as we're looking at the verses, the first of the four contrasts that differing, differentiate our body in the ground and our body up from the grave. So four contrasts, the first one being immortal as opposed to mortal. And that, that, that's a big one. That's a big one. We now have an expiration date, and the body that's raised won't have one. We won't be salad in the fridge. We'll be glorious Twinkies. Woo. I just wanted to hear somebody say that in a sermon. That's why I said it. So, so that means we won't dissolve like we are now. That means our bodies then will be unbreakable, as opposed to this one that's already broke. <coughs> so not only will our bodies be raised in the image of Christ immortal, but our resurrection will be glorious. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. So Paul's use of dishonor is elsewhere used to describe the loss of citizenship. Right? When we die, we have lost all our citizenship among the land of the living. Unless there's some type of government conspiracy, we won't, we won't be able to get to vote in elections. So when people die, we embalm them. Because we like to stop as much as possible this decay for the funeral. And we embalm them so that somebody might be fooled into thinking that that body laying there is still alive. To somehow avoid the dishonor, decay thing of death. The corpse then gets buried and it becomes out of sight out of mind and then we get this marble or stone <coughs> rock that we lay and people come to that you know why there's headstones because nobody really wants to see corpses they try to put a placeholder in for for you at that headstone and it's not likely to crumble it's not likely to break down like your body did. So what we're saying here in verse chapter 15 is that we will not need the placeholder of a headstone when this body is raised because it will be glorious. Verse 43 says it may go down into the ground in dishonor, but it's one, it's not saying there, and two, not coming up in dishonor, but it's coming up in glory. So this tells us that God is not going to start over with a blank slate. God is not going to make something from something else. He's going to take the decayed body and make it new. The same thing that got sown is going to be raised, but dishonor will be gone and glory will be what it has in it. As Wayne Gruden says, the word glory is often used in Scripture to describe the bright, shining radiance that surrounds the presence of God himself. Terms suggest that there will also be a kind of brightness or radiance surrounding our bodies 
that will be appropriate outward evidence of the position of exaltation and rule over all creation that God has given us. So Jesus says this, talking at the end of the age, as I read earlier in Matthew 13, talking about the parable of the soils. And the outcome of this is, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. God is going to take a decaying body and raise it gloriously. So how else will we be uh, transformed in our resurrection? Well, it will be immortal, glorious, and thirdly, powerful. Powerful, verse 43. So do you understand the significance of what this means? We get weaker and weaker and weaker until all our strength is eaten away by death. And then on the day of our resurrection from the dead, we will be raised in power. It will be the first time that our body experiences this type of power. Even the most powerful among us will not have ever experienced this glorious power on this day. Immortal, glorious, powerful, and fourthly, spiritual. Go to verse 44 with me. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. So if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So here's what a natural body is. It is a body that is made suited for the world down here. The problem with those bodies is they decay like salad in the bottom of the fridge. It must be sown and raised in a spiritual body. Dr. Tom, Tom Schreiner says the fact that we'll have a spiritual body doesn't mean that we don't have a physical body. He says what Paul means by a spiritual body is a body empowered and animated by the Holy Spirit. The body is physical, but in contrast to one's earthly body, it lives in a whole new realm, for now it is a body enlivened by the Holy Spirit. Our body is going to make us a ghost. Right? We're not going to come up like zombies. This is just killing all your all's uh, misconceptions, right? We're not going to come up like zombies and eat brains and, and it be this gory, nasty, still decaying moment. It'll be glorious. But secondly, we're not going to be ghosts. That's not what we're going to be. So those of you planning to haunt someone right now just had your dreams shattered. I heard the sound of it, too. <laughs> because the very fact that Paul's pointing out here is that we will be raised bodily. So we're not going to turn into ghosts. We'll be like Christ. Here, feel my hands. You can feel his hands. Feel my side. You could feel his side. And you could recognize him as he is. All those things will be true of us as well. But our body will be enlivened by the Holy Spirit. As we look at this verse, we can look around at our natural bodies and know that the presence of a physical body now is evidence of a coming spiritual body. So, in Christ will be raised like plants from the ground, and two, like the man from heaven. Verse 45, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So he's what he does is he starts spending time here in verse 45 comparing the natural and spiritual bodies. And the first man was Adam. He was the first man God ever created. The first man to be raised from the grave in one of these bodies like this is Jesus. So he is the last Adam. And you see the difference in this comparison that he's been made. The first Adam had to be given life. 
The second Adam, Christ, is life giving. You see the difference between the two? He is life giving. Now, we have to keep this order straight. We're all born in Adam first and must be reborn in the second Adam. And the way that we are born in Adam shows us that the natural always goes before the spiritual. That's the point that he makes here in these verses. He references Genesis 2 as the first man, Adam, his residence was on earth, right? That was his address. And the second man, Jesus, is not just a man, but the God man. So Paul calls him the man of heaven. So he's not saying that Jesus didn't come to be like us, that he didn't come among us. He is saying that. Just as he shows us a historical Adam, shows us a historical Jesus, the two are linked in this case. But what he's saying is this summary for us in verse 49, between these two. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So as sure as all of us have participated in Adam, so shall we participate in Christ. That's what he's saying here in verse 49. That's what it means to bear the image of, or his likeness. We participated fully in his reality. Haven't we all participated fully in Adam? meaning that we have been just like him. There are those cocky among us who think that we could have done a better job than Adam, but God picked him as our representative, our federal head, so to speak, meaning that he was a perfect representation of who you are. And as we all look at our lives, we see ourselves as perfect representations of Adam, in which that we participate fully in his sin. We all question God's word just like Adam. Did God truly say these things? Yeah, see, that is our past. If we're Christians, that is our past. We bore the image and the likeness of Adam, but our future is to bear the image of the man of heaven. So we fully share in Adam's likeness. So shall, that's the just as. So just like this, that's going to be. So just as we participated fully in the image of Adam, skin and bone, that's what we are, so shall we participate in the image of the man of heaven. Adam and Christ. Here is what God is doing in us. In Romans 8 verse 29, he said for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. This is what God is doing in the hearts and lives of the Christian. Because we got all that dust on us. Our science is wrecked by those things. But what he's doing is, as we've participated in the man of dust, he's conforming us to the image of the man of heaven. And what he says here in 1 Corinthians 15 is, that day we will fully participate in that. Right? He's transforming our life right now to the image of Christ. We're repenting of sin, growing in God's word, hopefully. Growing more to be like his son. But his end for us is to bear this image of his son. So think about it like this. If, if, if it's God's desire for us that we would be changed into the man of dust, from the man of dust to the man of heaven, how much more should we want that? How much more should we want to be obedient to his charge in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58? to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in 
in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our work is not in vain. We'll get there next week in those verses. So he's changing us to be like Jesus. The resurrection will be the, the culmination of this. So how dare we as Christians cling to the man of dust? You see this transformation from the man of dust to the man of heaven? That's what he's doing in the life of the Christian. But how many of us want to keep our hands dusty? I know I do. But the man of heaven awaits, and to be conformed into his image awaits us. So he'll raise us like plants from the ground, Secondly, he'll raise us like the man of heaven. That's what he's going to do. That's what our resurrection will be like. Heard the story of a preacher from the old school. But he speaks now as boldly as ever. He is not popular, though the world is his parish. And he travels every part of the globe, speaks in every language. He visits the poor, calls upon the rich, preaches to people of every religion. He preaches to people of no religion. And the subject of his sermon is always the same, this preacher that we're talking about. He's eloquent. He stirs feelings in people that no other preacher could. He will rev your engine like nobody's business. He brings tears to eyes that never weep. His arguments are non-refutable. There's no heart that's unmoved by his force. He shatters life with his message. Most people hate this preacher. But everyone fears this preacher. Who is he? What's his name? His name is Death. His name is Death. Every tombstone is his pulpit. Every newspaper prints his text. And someday every one of us will be the subject of his sermon. We all have a fast approaching appointment with his message. <clears throat> A resurrection from the dead will not just come in handy for us. It's not just something that will come in handy. It will be good to have. Right? We are in desperate need of the resurrection from the dead. All of us. Because of our appointment with this preacher. According to verse 48 that we've looked at today. Humanity is split into two groups. Those who are of the man of dust now and those who are the man of heaven. A reminder from verse 22 that in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. <coughs> John 5.38 tells us an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear the voice of of the Son of God, and will come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There's a resurrection of life and a resurrection of judgment. Those who are of the man of dust, and those who are of the man of heaven. The truth is that we participated in the man of dust and that participation have, has led us to death and separation from God. What we stand in need of today is one who defeated death, hell, and the grave. And who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his body. We need this transformation that he's talking about. Because we've separated ourselves from God by what we've done against Him. Well, God has brought Himself to us. Knowing that 
Christ suffered for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. So he lived the perfect life and died in our place and rose on the third day for our justification. He rose to show that his death paid the penalty for our sin and now he commands us to turn from our sin and trust in him. So if you're not a Christian today, don't get hung up on the two sermon points that you, we're going to be raised like plants from the ground and like the man of heaven because if you're not a Christian, you get raised to the resurrection of judgment. So all bets are off. Forget everything I said, except that if you're not in Christ, you will be raised to the resurrection of judgment. All of this were for Christians that we're talking about. So if you're not a Christian, you need to turn from your sin and trust in the Lord Jesus, and you need to come see me over to the side as uh, in this time of response. If you haven't joined the RBC or been baptized, you can let us know that you desire to do that during this time as well. Let us be uh, faithful to respond to God's word today. Pray with me.